Okay, um, Mr. Vice President, uh, fellows, and guests, and in particular, uh, a guest this evening, uh, Lady Camoys, who is uh, representing um, the, the family that have lived at uh, Stoner Park for uh, some 800 years. And uh, I hope we'll perhaps learn something new about the house that maybe she didn't know before. Um, I'm needing to move this picture on, and I right. So, Stoner Park, Oxfordshire. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the house, the chapel, and its tower to the right-hand side is the subject of uh, this evening's paper. Um, I'll start by saying something about the historical background. The questions that uh, we faced when looking at the building, the buildings themselves, the chapel itself, the tower, and buildings that are not there now, the priests' houses, uh, some answers to the questions, uh, and of course, inevitably, some more questions. Uh, I'd like to, uh, first of all, acknowledge a whole range of people who've helped in this project, which was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, and uh, John Steen, whose name appears uh, down there at the bottom of the list, and I uh, worked on this in 2014 and 15, and it's the result of that that uh, I'm here to, uh, this afternoon. So um, that's the list of uh, some of the people who helped, and um, uh, my thanks go out to all of them and others not, not mentioned. I'm sure you all know where Stoner is, but it's uh, somewhere north of Henley um, on Robert Plott's map. Uh, it's, uh, there is a Stoner there with a sort of um, illustrative chapel or house there, uh, it's not possible to use plot as a, as a terribly good guide to the actual structures. But uh, funnily enough from Rykut, which has got a really super chapel on plot's map. Um, the first edition Orden survey map, again, somewhat unexpectedly, is also not terribly helpful. Uh, as you can see, the chapel uh, here is set off against the uh, southeast wing of the, the house, uh, and there are very peculiar lines around it, uh, which, and it doesn't show the tower in any sensible form. Um, we'll see later um, what may have been happening here. Some of these excrescences are understandable, but, but some are not, at least on the basis of current archeology. span but we have some wonderful uh, illustrations, in particular this one of 1687, showing the house as it then was, with the chapel and its tower behind it on the right-hand side. And you'll notice a wall coming out from the, um, the southwest corner of the chapel uh, and then extending round a little um, group of trees before completing the uh, quadrangle at the front and keeping out all these uh, coaches and, and horses. Uh, a better illustration of the um, building was uh, prepared by Dr. W. A. Pantin and produced, uh, reproduced here in the Victoria County History volume, volume eight for Oxfordshire of uh, 1964. And, and this is a very, uh, very much more helpful showing the chapel down there at the bottom right-hand corner and the tower just to the north of it, uh, showing very well the, first of all, the awkward relationship between the tower and the chapel, the tower itself being more aligned with the east wall of the house than it is with, with anything else relating to the chapel. And we'll come back to that uh, later on. Uh, first of all, a bit about the context of uh, these medieval private chapels. Um, Nicholas Orm, um, in one of his books, uh, had calculated that there might have been about 5,000 of these in the Middle Ages, 
privately owned uh, within, uh, within houses. They, they were in a rather peculiar position, a peculiar both with a small and a large P, perhaps, because they had to be licensed by the diocesan bishop, because the, the bishop uh, would have preferred to have all the clergy and all the baptisms and marriages and funerals under his own control, rather than to have uh, uh, privatization, as it were. Um, so you had to have a license. And we know that the chapel at Stoner was licensed to, uh, to do all sorts of things at various points in time. There's documentary evidence for the baptism in 1482 of uh, 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 the son of Sir William Stoner at that time. And uh, burials are also mentioned there in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, 1474. Lady Anne Stoner in 1518 was not actually buried at Stoner. The, the main service, the main funeral service, was actually at the church at Purton, which is, uh, well, it's not exactly nearby, but it's the, it was the parish church at that time. Um, but there was, a, there was a private service at the chapel. And Stoner is, um, as well as being um, important in its own right, of course, as a, not only as a building, but as somewhere that has seen um, a continuous uh, Catholic uh, worship um, since the 14th century, um, is one of an important group of, of similar chapels in the Thames Valley, and I've mentioned uh, three of them there, the houses at uh, East Hendred. Uh, the, the chapel at East Hendred, of course, is still in use. Um, those at Stanton Harcourt and Rycourt are in a different uh, position. And of course, there's a great history of the uh, continuation of Catholic worship in the Thames Valley, uh, with Maple Durham, of course, being another uh, major house in the area, although their, their chapel is, of course, uh, a later one. The, I'm going to tell you a lot about uh, the building itself, but uh, just to start off with um, some brief review of the documentation. Uh, the first mention of a chapel at Stoner is in 1331. Um, I actually managed to track down the particular document, but that's for another time. The the key um, one uh, for the purposes of this uh, paper is a 1349 document um, under which Sir John Stoner, and that's him, his effigy in uh, Dorchester Abbey there, um, which allowed him to enlarge the chapel, implying that there was, of course, an earlier one there, and uh, having a license for six chaplains to celebrate Mass. Uh, there is some doubt as to whether all six arrived uh, in 1349 or indeed survived the Black Death. Um, and and the, where these chaplains were, uh, what their accommodation was, where it was, it is one of the uh, unanswered questions. Another important document is in 1416 to 17, an account, a building account, well, and other things, which uh, refers to Flemish workmen working at Stoner and a large number of bricks from uh, Crocker End, which is near Nettlebed, uh, just uh, in, the, in the same general area. And other, uh, other things, of course, to do with Stoner, the most um, well-known one, of course, is the publication uh, that Edmund Campion uh, carried out there in, a, in a, uh, initially a secret press um, of his uh, Decem Rationes in, in, in 1581, and then of course his subsequent arrest. Uh, after, the, after that, uh, of course, um, the various uh, difficulties over um, the uh, Catholic persecutions, and later the Civil War, in which there was considerable damage to the chapel, in particular to the tombs in there, 
uh, during that time. Then we have to leap further forward to the end of the 18th century, uh, where we've got uh, in the Stoner archive a wonderful collection of accounts and letters relating to a major phase of the building between 1796 and the, and the early part of the uh, 19th century, and I'll say a bit about that uh, later on. Well, here we are uh, on a nice uh, sunny day like today. Um, the chapel, as you can see, is a uh, flint structure with a plain tile roof, uh, relatively plain building, the tower behind brick with the cupola on the top. The, the structure between the two uh, is a Victorian uh, linking structure which seems to have replaced an earlier one. There is one showed in the 1687 um, print I showed you earlier on, but it's a slightly different uh, affair. One of the questions that we had when we first looked at this building was to do with the rather odd arrangement of stone on the south wall. You can see a, um, uh, a band of limestone ashlar coming in here and then it drops down and there are some more stones here. And in between there is a, uh, what looks like the end of a, a wall, broken off bits of stone. Uh, as I pointed out earlier on, of course, this, the wall in the 1687 painting is, is at the west end and not there. So what was actually um, going on there? Uh, what, in fact, were the dates and phases of the chapel as a whole? And as I s said earlier on, what, uh, where were the priests' houses and what uh, was the purpose of the tower? And indeed, when was it built? So we'll start off with the wall. Um, this is a close-up of both those uh, illustrations showing you the, the, the broken stones and the wall coming out from the West End. Um, it was clear when um, the people working at the chapel to build a new uh, drain, um, the, 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 the way that that, ch that trench has been dug cuts across just at the foot of the picture where, the, where that wall might have been and um, neither in the uh, trench nor in the, in the chapel wall itself, with a, a drawing of which is shown um, at, the, uh, at the foot there, is there any evidence that the wall was anywhere other than where that broken set of stones is. And indeed, um, that other people have suggested that, that uh, those broken stones suggested that the west end of the chapel had been rebuilt. Uh, and that's not true either because the, the uh, evidence at the, at the wall plate level there in the lower picture shows no change at all in any of the stonework until you get um, uh, into work which was done later to create the vault which you can see in the chapel inside. So I think we've fairly convincingly dealt with the, the easiest question of all. The wall must have come out uh, at that point there and, the, and the, the 1687 picture shows it in a slightly different place, uh, not in the correct place. Uh, just to go around the chapel quickly, um, the east end is the rather a nondescript picture at the top left. Uh, the scar there is a, a, a string course and underneath um, there is some evidence for the, uh, there having been a sacristy building built on there inside the chapel. As you'll see shortly, there are two doors at the east end and those went into that, uh, that building at one time. That was all demolished uh, in the 1960s. The north wall, as you can see, is plain, completely blind, yet internally there are alcoves that look as though they are blocked windows. Again, there's no evidence for any blocking of windows. And that peculiar uh, 
excrescence in the first edition Northern Survey map suggests that at that time there was something built against this wall. We know there was something built there uh, in the 20th century, and you'll see pictures of that uh, later on. But um, uh, as far as we can tell, um, those windows were not uh, never open. Okay, you enter the uh, the public entrance to the to the chapel is through the west end doorway there into an ante chapel or narthex, uh, from which two doors, one either side of painting, uh, up steps lead into the uh, the chapel itself. Um, this is a view from the gallery looking down. Uh, and those are the two doors at the far end that I mentioned. Uh, one at least went into the sacristy building uh, at the east end. And there you see the vault. Um, the colour scheme, and this is before the current restoration work that was carried out. Um, the, the focusing is, I'm afraid, due to my poor photography rather than to uh, uh, the, the technology, I'm sure. Um, the um, the colour scheme here was was done in the uh, 20th century um, at the, that time, taking advice from uh, people like John Piper, Osbert Lancaster, I think, was involved in this as well. It was intended to reflect the 18th the 18th century scheme. So this is this is essentially what that end of the 18th and start of the 19th century arrangement was meant to, to look like. Down at the east end, uh, the altar with uh, its marble, green marble front, um, gift of uh, Henry Blundell of Ince, who was a famous collector of marbles, and indeed was the um, the father-in-law of the Thomas Stoner, who, and there have been at least seven of them, perhaps uh, a lot more now, uh, by this time, who was responsible for this work uh, at the uh, end of the uh, 18th century. And there you've got a closer view of the, the doors, this kind of Gothic with a K uh, arrangement that uh, was perhaps going out of fashion by that time, but nevertheless was, was obviously felt to be um, the way to, uh, to go. Um, the windows, um, the stained glass, the windows have a story of their own as well. Um, they were um, uh, designed by Francis Edgington, a um, uh, noted uh, stained glass uh, manufacturer at the end of the uh, 18th century. Um, he, uh, he had a bit of a problem at Stoner because um, the window openings were enlarged and uh, he had designed the windows thinking that they were to be the pre-enlargement size. So I think the, the, the border uh, in the left-hand window, which is one of the original ones, um, is uh, as a result of that, he had he um, he agreed that it was his fault, and he had to and, and paid for the uh, the redoing of the glass um, out of his uh, out of his fee. So um, that's one of the um, numerous actually um, instances here of things going wrong that you get in the in the building accounts. The, the plaster work I mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, again, it's not terribly clear which of these gentlemen, James Thorpe of London, who was certainly paid a, a, a quite a significant sum of money for work on the plaster work, but the, the work seems to have been carried out by a Reading um, uh, craftsman, Samuel Kerrod, and there is a plaintive note in the documents from Thorpe um, saying that uh, the fact that the, the plaster wasn't um, uh, drying out properly wasn't his fault. It must be something to do with somebody else or the lack of ventilation or something like that. So again, you can 
sort of read between the lines to see the way in which these these arguments between uh, builders and architects and uh, others uh, went on when something actually like that goes wrong. Other local work, uh, workmen were involved, slea makers of Henley, um, Francis Edgington I've mentioned on the glass, but other firms, uh, London firms and from elsewhere were involved in producing fittings as well, as well and, and all the information uh, about this. Um, is, uh, is in the, the, the Stoner papers. Um, Thomas Stoner took advice. Uh, uh, not only was he given materials by his father-in-law, but also advice on um, what paintings to uh, have, particularly the, the, the east window. That was his uh, suggestion. Um, and uh, somebody else, uh, Thomas Weld of Aston, who must have been a family friend, also, also gave advice here. So um, we're getting a number of people having their own uh, say in matters. But, but Thomas seems to have been um, uh, of his own mind quite a lot. He doesn't take all the advice. So to the, to the archaeology of the building. Um, we were privileged to uh, have access to the, the whole of the chapel uh, roof when the, the tiles were removed and uh, John Steen and I did a, a, a very detailed survey of all the uh, timber there and uh, this will uh, form the next part of what I need to uh, tell you about. The, uh, we didn't actually have to do uh, a detailed drawing, thankfully. But, uh, due to modern technology, um, uh, th this can all be done in a matter of minutes by lasers and things. Uh, and this is the result. Um, as it says there, Warner Land Survey has carried out this work. The disturbance at the left-hand side is, of course, where the tower is. And you'll immediately see that there is a difference between the arrangement of rafters at the left-hand side uh, and the main body of the chapel uh, to, the, to the right. And that is, that's really uh, the main clue as to the development of the building. Because those, uh, that, that small uh, section of uh, timber at the at the west end consists of this scissor braced roof. Uh, this is uh, an early style, we uh, recognize that, and thanks to uh, Dan Miles' uh, tree ring dating, uh, the date of uh, 1347 was obtained very conclusively for uh, the scissor braces themselves. The, the roof had been rebuilt. Uh, particularly uh, in, in the north uh, side, the, the, the part that, that uh, reaches up towards the tower, every one of those rafters, that's the ones on the right-hand side of this shot, uh, were replaced in 1505. That's a, why that might have been the case is another um, something we'll have to, have to come back to. But this is a braced roof. Uh, was supported by uh, a horizontal plate supported by a bracket on resting on a corbel. This is the one at the far uh, west end. And this um, suggested uh, that, in fact, there was perhaps a crown post roof underneath the scissor braced arrangement, although the crown post itself uh, wasn't there. The assembly marks on the rafters were a very odd mixture. There was no rationale in terms of numbering from the west uh, in regular manner. Some parts of the roof had certainly been rebuilt, possibly in the 1505 uh, reconstruction uh, at the north side. And indeed some of the, the symbols here are not quite clear how they how they work, the circles 
for example, sometimes appear attached to the numbers and sometimes detached from them. But the two um, scissor braces at the far east, and that should say west end, um, had between them, in grooves, a oak panel. And because the, the whole arrangement at that end had not been disturbed, and this was in the undisturbed uh, slope of the roof, um, this must have been um, the 1347 uh, roof. It had, um, and um, although the panel itself was undateable, uh, its, uh, its tree rig arrangement suggested to Dan that it was Baltic oak, uh, of which we see numbers in um, that area, the famous uh, roof uh, uh, of the um, Lady Chapel in St. Helens Abingdon is, uh, it has Baltic oak as well. So this is, uh, this is uh, what the original roof there uh, would have looked like. And you can see underneath it there is a um, later plaster ceiling. So the, um, that's the story at the, at the west end there. Um, and the, uh, the rather rare feature um, is the support of the, of the scissor braces by by a crown post roof. Quite a rare feature, but uh, thanks to um, Nat Alcock, who is here today and pointed this out to me, there are examples. Um, th there are a number of examples. For example, the, um, the, the, the church at Harwell, Oxfordshire, Folney, Berkshire, has one of these in one of its um, transepts. But the, the, the question is, is this an original feature of the roof? Uh, and the Max Stoke example here, um, I think Nat felt that this was perhaps an example of an original one and maybe therefore, um, given the similarity of dates with uh, Stoner, um, perhaps the closest analogy and perhaps an argument for, for it being primary. The, the scissor brace roof ended and the main part of the roof was, in fact, a crown post roof. Uh, again, not all there, but these are the collars. You can see there, going off into the distance with gaps uh, and sitting on top of a collar purlin or a crown plate there uh, to keep the, the whole thing uh, stable. Crown posts, for those who um, I don't follow uh, the details of uh, Medieval carpentry are meant to look like this. This is a, an example again um, from the period when these crown post roofs were uh, at their heyday um, in the 14th century. This is an example from just down the road in, uh, in Henley. However, the crown post roof at uh, Stoner is rather odd for a number of reasons. First of all, um, here are some of the assembly marks, they're, they're chiselled there, they're all in order, they're, they're very well carried out, it's a very well constructed roof, but of rather thin timbers and felled as late as 1577 to 8. This is extremely late for a crown post roof. Uh, why did they do that? Possibly a reason might be because there was one in the earlier part of the roof. Uh, and they're very thin and they are, it, it's, it, it's very much uh, uh, a peculiar um, roof to find in, in, at that late date. Sadly, um, in the work carried out in the um, 1790s, all the crown posts and the, uh, some of the other features were removed, so we don't have the full uh, story there, but it, the, it, it's quite clear what was going on. The empty mortises and so on show it, um, show it quite clearly. What happened uh, in the 1790s was that uh, the whole arrangement was cut out. 
But in order to uh, keep the building up um, the, and, to keep, and to support the, um, the plaster vault that you saw earlier on, um, these huge bulks of softwood uh, were introduced. These are the these ones here, which form this uh, arrangement here, with bolted together with these heavy uh, bolts. Um, how do I know they're from Danzig? Well, thanks to um, uh, Tansy Collins, who's done a survey of Baltic timber uh, for a dissertation. This mark here, this little star, is is one of the indicators of uh, the source of the timber, and it's um, the, the these marks not only give the source, they give quality, they sometimes give the ship's name, they sometimes give the merchant's details and dates and all sorts of other things. Um, she hasn't looked at this roof yet, but um, there's potential here for maybe working out uh, a bit more about where these uh, might have came, uh, come from, but at least we know they came from the Eastern Baltic. Uh, the tie beams were cut off. They were rather nice tie beams with a nice little chamfer and stop uh, here. As you can see, it's just sawn off there. It's one of John's diagrams showing, showing how that was, was carried out. Um, the, one of these, well, in fact more than one, uh, a number of the tie beams seem to have been reused as purlins to support the, the plaster vault. This, um, the, the, the lengths were, uh, were, were uh, fitted the, the bill, and this, um, the crown post itself seems to have sat in that, uh, in that mortise there. And the, um, this arrangement down here is support, this is the, this is the 1796 plaster vault down there, supported by these um, struts uh, from the um, from that uh, from that purlin. So um, I think we're fairly clear about what was happening in, in the chapel roof. In fact, the chapel, the history of the chapel. Whether there was certainly no evidence of the earlier chapel. Uh, the whatever had happened in 1347. And of course, it relates to the 1349 um, uh, provision for uh, the six priests and so on. Um, the earliest fabric visible in Stone Chapel today is that 1347 roof. The various other changes um, I've mentioned uh, leading up to the major rebuilding at the end of the 18th century and um, the insertion of the present uh, vault. So that's the easy bit. Uh, <laughs> the, the difficult bit is the tower. Um, it, sit, it, it sits within the chapel, as you can see there, um, and is clearly from the archaeology later than the chapel. Uh, it's got five separate stages in this rough diagram here. You can see What's happening, the lower two stages consist entirely of a brick spiral staircase, and then the areas above have a uh, timber uh, stair going up, and rooms with windows to them at each of the three main upper stories. But also, and you can see it, I think, perhaps slightly in the photograph there, there are large openings in the um, in the brickwork, or which are now closed in, both in the um, in, in the east facade here and here, these, and in the west here and here, and these uh, cannot have been for anything else other than for doorways. At least some of them may have been large windows, but but. Uh, uh, at least three of them look as though they were doorways, uh, very high level, so some form of, of gallery perhaps going around there, um, some form of access to, um, 
to the various rooms. We'll come back to that uh, later on. There's the base uh, and the staircase going up in the tower. There's a detail of the east face of the tower. The present staircase is not very, and the timber in the tower is not very helpful because as you can see here on the right hand side, the staircase cuts across an earlier window. So um, how one got up or down the, those upper floors um, when those windows were usable um, must have been in some other way and there's no way of telling now where that was. It may just have been the ladder, of course. At the very top, um, we've got uh, on the left-hand side the upper brickwork and you can probably just see here that there is some use of black or, or at least grey header stones. I'm not getting this thing to um, work it out, but here there is a suggestion of diaper work in the, in the brickwork, glazed headers used in a diagonal pattern. You can see also that there's been a large opening there that's been blocked in and, and a, a later window sat in. I don't think that large opening could possibly have been uh, that shape originally, but um, because it's been blocked in, we'll never know. Uh, the clock is fairly modern, there it is down um, on the other side, uh, and um, I, I can't, I'm not going to say much more about that, except to say that at the very top, uh, the cupola again is a, a bell. The, the cupola and the bell don't appear in the 1687 illustration, um, they don't appear in an 1825 illustration either, so they are probably sometime in the mid uh, 19th century. And they've been refurbished now as part of the, the, the recent work. Uh, right, going back to the, uh, the 15th century documents that um, might help us in working out what's going on in the tower um, this is the account um, of John Wearfield, um, in the, as you can see, in the, probably in the top there, the, there's the, his name, Wearfield here, and uh, Thomas Stoner uh, next to it. And this is the account that um, is well known. It refers to the, um, the, 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 build, the making of bricks. Uh, at um, Crocker End um, by a chap called John Warwick. It refers, sorry, Richard, um, Michael Warwick, sorry. Um, uh, and carriage of bricks um, and various other things. The um, Thomas Carpenter seems to have been building a dovecot. Uh, and the final um, item in that um, account is for uh, 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 doing something to the tower and given that it's somebody called Thomas Plummer one assumes that this is lead lead work on the, on the tower uh, and but it, what it does do is, is tell us that there is a tower of some sort there in uh, 1416 um, the, the bricks uh, do form a bit of a problem um, 200,000 bricks uh, is far too many for the tower. Um, we calculated something like 40,000 at most for the tower. Um, so if they uh, came to Stoner, then some of them must have been used for something else. And of course, those of you who know Stoner Park will know that there is an awful lot of brick there from all sorts of periods. And um, uh, so it, 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 they may have gone, the rest of them may have gone uh, for something else. The other odd thing in this is the 15 pounds for carriage of bricks from Crocker End to Stoner. The, 
the carriage cost 18 shillings per thousand bricks. So he's only getting 16,700 bricks carried for 15 pounds. So a very small uh, proportion of the bricks are in this account. So I, we don't fully understand that and John is working on a transcription in the, of this and I hope that maybe we'll, we may find something else uh, to help uh, in this uh, later on. So watch this space. Fleming's, of course, the Flemish um, uh, brick making and brick working in um, the Thames Valley area and the, 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 um, the, the Chilterns near uh, in the Henley area, of course, is well known. The uh, 1437 uh, complex of almshouses and school and so on at UL uh, is a very clear example. That's the, the bottom left shows the brickwork over the doorway. They're compared with uh, a similar example um, in Belgium. Um, there isn't, um, again, in the tower anything um, to, that, that is typically Flemish about, about it, but of course um, uh, th that doesn't, doesn't mean to say that uh, they, they weren't used on the, on the brickwork in the tower when they came over. So there, is, there are a number of issues with uh, the tower which um, we haven't really got to the bottom of and there are some questions, some of which um, you, you might be able to answer later on when I've sat down, um, particularly the diaper brickwork which, um, if it's off 1416, puts it um, some 20 years earlier than what I think may well be the earliest. Um, diaper brickwork surviving uh, at Tattershall, and there are others, of course, at um, uh, Eton and, and, and elsewhere. But, but again, if, if anybody knows of any other examples, I'd, I'd like to hear from them. Uh, the, the dating of the towers: there was a there was a timber which did date from a period in the fifth, uh, the perhaps the late um, late fifteenth, early sixteenth century. But it, given that that staircase had been um, moved and that perhaps even the chapel, even the tower has been extended upwards, which is another uh, possibility uh, at that time. Um, we can't really tell. It's, it, it wasn't, there weren't enough timbers, datable timbers to, to, um, uh, to be conclusive. Did the rebuilding of the, of the chapel roof in 1505 have anything to do with this? Uh, it is possible that the, in fact, the most obvious thing is that there, um, there was a, when the, the tower was built, they left a valley gutter between the tower and the chapel roof, which let the water in, as these things do, and the timbers rotted and had to be replaced in 1505. I think that's the obvious reason. There is later a roof built over that, which currently stops um, water getting through. So it, it clearly was a problem after 1505 as well. So um, I, I think we can take it that that's the most obvious thing. It is possible, of course, that it, that it dates that part of the tower, but I'm uh, not sufficiently convinced of that as a, and to put it forward. But one of the interesting things about this tower is what is it for? It clearly had some relationship to the priests' houses because the, the, both the current tradition and indeed, um, as I'll suggest in a minute, uh, the, 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 the priests would probably have lived in that angle between the chapel and the house. They certainly did live there in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries and probably did so earlier on. So um, it obviously had something to do with them um, my feeling is that it might have been a tower from which they descended into the chapel uh, so as not to disturb the family during the night, for example, if they were uh, carrying out uh, uh, services then or saying prayers or something like that. Um, and because and I think that the only way in, until the 
sacristy building was built, the only way into the chapel was either down the tower or from the west wing, the west uh, doorway. So um, perhaps again we can discuss this afterwards, um, how did this complex work uh, and what might those upper rooms have been for, were they vestries or something like that. Um, which brings us to the priests' houses themselves. Certainly, uh, th th that area in the north corner between here, between the house and the, the chapel, um, this line here must be the uh, priests' houses as they were at the end of the 19th century, um, and probably where the earlier ones were as well. Um, at East Hendred, they're in this sort of semi, in this northern location, semi uh, shielded from the house. Then a tower at Rycourt and Stanton Harcourt. Um, never in the main house, question mark, um, were the priests in these chapels always kept in separate accommodation. Again, if anybody's got any examples, uh, one way or the other, I'd, like, I'd be interested to hear of those. And this area to the north was was traditionally known in the family as the cloister, and um, obviously uh, with good reason. This is the, a 19th century, or, well, 20th century picture uh, of the 19th century, uh, how a priest's houses at the north side of the chapel. There you can see this is from Country Life. You can see these buildings here. The, uh, the, whatever they may have looked like, um, these um, flat-ish monopitch roofs uh, are certainly not uh, medieval and that uh, chimney stack is, is fairly, fairly modern. Uh, these were demolished, however, uh, there's one of them has gone by the 1960s and the remaining one has only got a single pot on it and is um, the boiler house for the uh, heating system that was installed in the chapel um, at, that, uh, at that time. Uh, there was another trench dug by the um, uh, team building the, the, a new drainage system for the chapel going right through that area at the north and there were some shallow brick foundations found, that's, the, that's them uh, where the, near the ranging rod there and a sample of the brick as you can see it's a it's a relatively modern brick with a frog in it so it's not a medieval brick the foundations are not medieval foundations they wouldn't really have held up very much uh, by way of a structure anyway a boiler house yes but um, substantial accommodation for uh, priests whether there were six or fewer um, uh, unlikely. So sadly that was not conclusive in, in, in helping us decide where those would have been. So um, that's the sort of uh, picture that we've got of the uh, priest's houses um, somewhere in that area and how did they link to the tower? How did they get up to these walkways and how, did, how was the building used? So that's been a, a, a sort of romp through uh, the work that uh, was done at the chapel um, a couple of years ago now, and the results, some of which are pretty conclusive, particularly in terms of dating the timber work on the chapel and the way in which that relates to the uh, 1349 license. The tower, um, something probably there, by, the, by 1416, something to do with the priests, but exactly what was going on, we don't know. And then this astonishing rebuild in 1578 with this archaic uh, roof style and the major refurbishment uh, into its, almost its present state um, in the end of the 19th century, 18th century rather. Um, I'm afraid that I haven't got any pictures of, of what it looks like today, but um, the work that's been done um, will ensure, I hope, that um, 
it'll certainly survive for uh, centuries to come. Uh, the damp problems uh, round about have been dealt with by drainage and a new floor, which is now um, a stone rather than concrete, which should help matters. And um, I, uh, I'm sure that, um, uh, and, and since it is in, in very good hands, that it'll, it'll, uh, it'll last uh, a, few, a few lifetimes. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to hearing the answers to some of my questions. Thank you.